Good afternoon, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the 2018 State of the Coast Guard Address, which will be given by our 25th Commandant, Admiral Paul Zukump, here in just a few minutes. I want to thank you all for joining us today for this very important event. Now, the State of the Coast Guard Address is an annual event that dates back to 1975. Today, we have the privilege of hosting you at the historic National Press Club in this beautiful ballroom that has hosted heads of state, leaders of industry, and leaders of government. I'd like to thank the Coast Guard Band Brass Quintet under the leadership of Senior Chief Denton for their performance here today. Now we have a few distinguished guests that I'd like to go through. First, we have our Deputy Secretary, Elaine Duke. Thank you for being here, ma'am. Thank you for your service. We also have our 24... <laughs> And we have our 24th Commandant, Admiral Bob Papp. Sir, it's always good to see you. And our Vice Commandant, Admiral Chuck Michelle. Thank you, sir, for being here. And finally, we have Ms. Brandonino Zukump, the spouse, lovely spouse of our Commandant. It's good to have you here, Fran. And I want to say a special thank you to the Navy League of the United States for their continued support of this year's address. And finally, a very, very warm welcome is also extended to congressional staffers, military attache officers, senior government officials, local community partners, industry representatives, members of our other armed services, Coast Guard retirees, and the men and women of our United States Coast Guard who are here with us today. So welcome, all of you. Now here we are, two months into 2018, but I wanted to take a very quick look back at a historic 2017 that our Coast Guard had. From the tremendous hurricane response and recovery operations to record drug seizures, our workforce continued to show their relevance and dedication on an international stage. When major hurricanes made devastating landfalls in Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, your United States Coast Guard answered the call. Thousands of personnel manned aircraft, boats, emergency operations centers that provided assistance to and rescue of thousands of those in peril. First responders, like Petty Officer Second Class Ashley Leppert, she answered that call. Ashley was on the first helicopter out of Houston, and within a few hours, she had already rescued more than 40 people. Now, Petty Officer Leppert was recently honored as a special guest of the President at the President's State of the Union Address, where her efforts shined a huge spotlight on the great people we have in our Coast Guard for all Americans to see. And even when our own Coasties and their families were impacted directly by hurricane damage, it was their fellow shipmates that came to the rescue. And the American people got to witness what we get to see every day, that the spirit of a United States Coast Guardsman is unmatched. That's why we as leaders are continuing to pursue new cutters, boats, and aircraft to ensure we give our workforce the very best equipment to carry out the missions our country and our service demand of them. Now, we've commissioned new national security cutters and fast response cutters, upgraded many others, which have made major contributions, especially in the record drug seizures of 2017 where, in fact, we seize more cocaine and marijuana than we have ever in our history. But it's not just our offshore capabilities or the protection of our more than 95,000 miles of U.S. coastline. The Coast Guard is a vital part of America's vast inland river system. We enable the safe navigation of ships on America's rivers, which help facilitate more than $4.5 trillion in maritime economic activity last year. And as an armed service of the United States, the U.S. Coast Guard continues to support our DOD partners more and more every year. Recently, we had 12 members of our Maritime Security Response Team operating in CENTCOM's area of responsibility who were awarded the U.S. Navy Combat Action Ribbon for their participation in operations off the coast of Yemen. These and many other examples continue to show that the men and women of the United States Coast Guard have a spirit that's unbroken, hearts that are full of compassion, 
and the humanitarian drive to make real contributions to our service every day. I could not be more thankful or grateful to all of our active duty, reserve, auxiliary, civilian, and retirees. But most importantly, I want to say a special thank you to our families who support us every single day so that we can do our job. It's been my honor to serve as the 12th Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard and the privilege of a lifetime to serve this great country of ours. And as I retire this summer, I could not be more proud of the service that I have spent my entire adult life in and the men and women with whom I share this uniform as they continue to show that we are the world's best Coast Guard. The only time many Americans hear about the U.S. Coast Guard is during a major disaster or highly publicized search and rescue. Harvey pounded the Texas shoreline today. The Coast Guard pulled off a number of dramatic rescues. Our Anderson Cooper also is in the sky. He's with the Coast Guard. They're trying to decide where they're going to drop off these two people. There's a shelter nearby. Members of the Coast Guard have flown in from around the country. Rescue swimmer Graham McGinnis and his team helped save a family of three on Sunday. We have other people stranded in vehicles. And they are risking their lives to save lives. It seems like it's been relentless for you. I mean, it was Harvey, it's now Irma. This dramatic rescue to show you off the coast of Puerto Rico tonight, the U.S. Coast Guard. A woman and her two 12-year-old kids standing on top of an upside-down boat. Like Coast Guard Petty Officer Ashley Leppard. Ashley, we all thank you. Thank you very much. So you heard about the Coast Guard this year. But what you might not know is that despite massive response and recovery efforts, critical work continued around the globe. Crews defended U.S. maritime borders in record-setting fashion, keeping nearly $7 billion out of the hands of vicious transnational criminal organizations. The Inland Waterways Fleet safeguarded America's economic security, keeping shipping lanes open for more than $4.5 trillion worth of economic activity and working to quickly reopen ports damaged by the hurricanes. Cutter Healy projected sovereignty in the Arctic and the nation's one and only heavy icebreaker, the Polar Star, set sail for Antarctica to ensure access and protect key national interests. Americans trusted no matter the demand, no matter the mission, the Coast Guard would meet the call. Whether the task was less glamorous, like growing the cyber program, achieving a fifth consecutive clean financial audit, or continuing to deliver new cutters on time and on budget. Or whether in the national spotlight, the public the Coast Guard serves trust the nation's smallest armed force to do one specific thing. Get it done. One word, inspired. What you saw up there is what inspires me. That represents the state of the Coast Guard, the men and the women of the United States Coast Guard. But more importantly, it represents the talent of the Coast Guard as well. That wasn't a George Lucas production. That was produced by our very own Petty Officer First Class, Patrick Kelly. Uh, so what a great lead in to this year's State of the Coast Guard. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for being here for the State of the Coast Guard address for 2018. Again, I want to thank the National Press Club because there really is no better venue uh, because you are not the only audience. Uh, we stream this live and then when we stream it live, we do the data analytics afterwards. And when we did that last year, uh, we're now up to a 2 minute and 27 second viewing time. And that includes my mother who watches it multiple times over. <laughs> Uh, so we're trying to do a little bit better, 
Um, but we picked today, March 1st, for a special reason. Uh, you're going to have to stay tuned for longer than 2 minutes and 27 seconds to find out why we picked March 1st to deliver this State of the Coast Guard address. So let's get underway. So as we take in all lines, in the past we have characterized the Coast Guard. We usually use metaphors. Uh, we use metaphors that may not always be positive. Sometimes they cast a shadow on our service. When we use terms like dull knife, curse of semper paratus, uncertain and stormy seas, uh, metaphors that illuminate the challenges of the service, but maybe not the accomplishments and the deeds of the men and women who serve our United States Coast Guard. So when I stood before you last year, I stated that for a service that punches above its weight class, it's high time we were budgeted accordingly. Because quite honestly, uh, for many years, we have been budgeted in the lowest weight class, the flyweight class. And there was only one way for us to punch, and that was to punch up. And more recently, I directed my senior leaders to abandon the do or die suicide squeeze bunched stance that we have taken when it comes to defending our budget and that we need to approach the plate by swinging for the fences. That's right, seize the initiative. And today I am here to report that thanks to this Congress and this administration, we have hit our stride. And to quote our commander in chief, no brand has gone up like the Coast Guard brand. Incredible people that have done an incredible job. And just three hours ago, I was at another event where Vice President Pence called out the United States Coast Guard. And he said, no one has inspired this nation like the United States Coast Guard. So I could not agree more. The Coast Guard brand is up, and yes, it is way up. In fact, to say that the state of the Coast Guard is strong would be an understatement. Our truly incredible workforce has faced curveball after curveball in our response, prevention, and mission support enterprises, but it's our men and women who consistently rise to the occasion. In fact, they hit it out of the park. I could not be more proud, more inspired to lead this incredible branch of our armed services. Our brand, well, it's like our stock. So how do you keep your stock on the rise? Well, what inspires an investor to stay in the stock market? It comes down to one word, trust. Trust and confidence. It was Confucius who said, a state cannot survive without the confidence of its people. Nor can any company, and nor can the United States Coast Guard. Our Coast Guard cannot survive without the trust and confidence of the administration, of Congress, but most importantly, of the public that we serve. So again, I am profoundly grateful to this administration and Congress for the trust and confidence they have placed in our service, and especially in our service members, for their vision and their leadership to restore military readiness and for their efforts to help us secure our borders and to ensure our nation and our economic security. Truly, in this uncertain global environment, countering the many threats that our nation demands an all-hands-on-deck approach, working collaboratively within the Department of Homeland Security, defense, interagency, and our private sector families. And it is fitting, yes, on this day, March 1st, exactly 15 years ago today, the Department of Homeland Security officially opened its doors. And the unique military service that is the United States Coast Guard finally found its ideal home, where our capabilities and broad authorities align perfectly within the Department of Homeland Security missions. Now, it took over 200 years for the Department of Defense to become joint services under the 1986 Goldwater-Nichols Act. Yet in a mere 15 years, our department presents a united front, an alliance that integrates the authorities and personnel from each component to secure our borders and our homeland under the leadership of our Secretary, Kirsten Nielsen, who is represented today by our Deputy Secretary, Elaine Duke, 
who was our acting secretary during the trifecta of hurricanes this past year. Elaine, again, thank you for representing the department here today. We are honored to serve you. Ever since the father emeritus of our Coast Guard, and that's Alexander Hamilton, charged our first commanding officers to, quote, be impatient of the least mark of a dominating spirit, haughtiness, rudeness, or insult, end quote. Sustaining public trust dating back to 1790 has been a constant in our 227 years of service. As military and law enforcement officers, members of the intelligence community, and enablers of the maritime industry as lifesavers, as first responders, the Coast Guard uses every tool that we have to earn the trust placed in us. Day in and day out, our men and women employ our broad authorities to ensure the security and prosperity of our nation, and while doing so, they stand ready to respond to any disaster, natural or man-made. Now, this past fall, our nation experienced one of the most catastrophic hurricanes, three of them, on record. Working alongside federal, state, local partner agencies, FEMA, CBP, and the countless volunteers this incredible nation breeds, the Coast Guard surged nearly 3,000 first responders, more than 200 helicopters, cutters, small boats, fixed-wing aircraft, and we put them to good use. Yes, we saved nearly 12,000 Americans. Now, most of these men, women, and children were rescued from the roofs and flooded streets of Houston, Beaumont, and Port Arthur, Texas, areas not generally accustomed to seeing Coast Guard helicopters circling overhead, dangling rescue swimmers into urban settings as waters engulfed their homes. You saw images on the news. You heard the stories, our crews hoisting a young mother, clutching her children to her chest. Stranded children transported to the hospital to get dialysis treatment, just in time. And you saw ensigns Greg Veliki and James Gardner and others like them go to these very same hospitals when they got some time off to visit these children. Their efforts helped save a humanitarian service. But something you didn't see is that our men, our women, were responding despite the catastrophic losses they faced at home. You see, these cities, these are our homes. These are our communities. These are Coast Guard communities as well. And with spouses and children evacuating our Coast Guard families, it was our Coast Guard members who ran towards the eye of a hurricane. It was people like Senior Chief Joshua Martin, Lillard lost everything, lost his house. I think he's more mournful that he lost his beloved motorcycle, but he lost it all. But he showed up to work, and he would not leave until his command practically ordered him to do so. And then there were others like Petty Officer Travick Herbrank. He was caring for his elderly mother, but he too had to answer the call. But when he flew over her neighborhood, he saw that his mother's home was immersed in flood water. And he saw no sign whatsoever of his mother. Now, once Travis was on deck, he stopped every arriving flight crew to ask if they had seen his mother. And after several gut-wrenching hours, Travis finally learned that, yes, his mother was, in fact, hoisted to safety by one of our many helicopters operating out of Air Station Houston. And she was in the care at a nearby hospital. But yes, these storms get personal. And in the end, 700 Coast Guard families lost their homes. They had to be relocated. And the most profound impact to our members and their dependents were in Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Communities ravished by hurricanes Irma and Maria. And communities today that are just starting the path to long-term recovery as I stand before you. With most dependents evacuated, our men and women stayed, and they reported to work. I recall being in Puerto Rico and seeing one of our auxiliaries, Mariano Valasquez. Mariano showed up as Maria was still overhead. He left his home to help reconstitute our Coast Guard base. 
to restore the perimeter fencing, remove debris, and fix the damaged radio tower so we can have Coast Guard communications. And then he moved out to help reconstitute the island to ensure that the aids of navigation were watching properly and to open the port to get supplies flowing. He's an auxiliarist, a volunteer, a trusted member of his community. That's our United States Coast Guard. And it was the efforts of our prevention teams to restore and reconstitute the region's economically essential ports from Corpus Christi all the way up to Charleston to include U.S. Virgin Islands and San Juan, Puerto Rico. And they demonstrated the value of our waterways management mission to ensure that these waterways were opened well before commodities were even ready to flow. I could not be more proud. The American trusted us to respond, and respond we did. While so many endured these natural disasters, transnational criminal organizations continued to raise havoc and stir civil disorder in the Western Hemisphere. These networks persistently harm America and our way of life. They undermine social order through drug trafficking, human smuggling networks. They increase violent crimes, spur illegal activity along our borders, and directly contribute to historically high drug-related deaths of U.S. citizens each year, 64,000 in 2016. Without question, these criminal organizations, they are cancerous groups that directly threaten our national security. And the Coast Guard is working to put this cancer in remission. Last year, our campaign to protect the U.S. border far out at sea netted $7.2 billion worth of cocaine before it could reach our shores, our streets, our friends, and our families. Equally important, last year, we referred 606 smugglers to the Department of Justice right here in the United States for prosecution, 100% prosecution. Evidence we obtained at sea helped our HSI, DEA, and FBI partners open a window into this cancerous world that enabled them to cripple major networks that capitalize on an illicit and poisonous trade. Prosecution begets more prosecution, and our whole of government approach advances security and prosperity in our backyard. And this effort is paying dividends multilaterally and next month, we will work with SAMAR, the Mexican Navy, the Colombian Navy, as we enjoin that partnership, because the United States cannot take this threat down alone, and we're going to approach this in a multilateral, transparent way. And we're building a strong alliance, and again, centered around the trust of the United States Coast Guard. At the same time, we are paying close attention to our northernmost border, what I would call our fourth coast, Yes, we are an Arctic nation. Leadership in this most arduous and largely unexplored domain, for the most part, has defaulted to the United States Coast Guard. We are trusted in the Arctic to preserve our sovereignty, to preserve our precious oil and minerals, to ensure access to opening shipping routes, and let's not forget to keep our border secure in a region with an emerging U.S. coastline and a mounting Russian footprint. In fact, the Coast Guard provides and is the single point of failure for assured surface access and the preservation of our national interests in both the Arctic and Antarctica. But our Coast Guard men and women need the right tools to accomplish this mission, and it will take the recapitalization of our polar icebreakers be able to continue to exert national sovereignty in the high latitudes. And that is why I am pleased to announce that very soon, I mean real soon, I'm talking tomorrow, we will release a request for proposal with the support of both the administration and Congress to acquire the first heavy icebreaker, the first installment that will recapitalize our nation's fleet of icebreakers. Yes, the Coast Guard is back.
But none of our borders, north, south, east, or west, are truly secure without a secure cyber domain. Terrorists used our transportation system as a weapon against us on 9-11. We are entrusted to make sure the same does not happen through the manipulation of the cyber domain today. We secure our maritime critical infrastructure, ports, waterways, and commerce, and that translates to $4.6 trillion in economic activity on an annualized basis. We now have a cyber security program of record. We constituted a cyber protection team on budget and in 2019, we will launch a cyber major at the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. And we must continually innovate and adapt to this ever-changing world of work. And that begins with harnessing the talent across our active duty, reserve, civil servant, and auxiliary workforce. We have the right triad, prevention, response, mission support to sustain our service as long as we uphold the standard of public trust, continually attract, grow, and sustain the enormous talent of our workforce. But we don't live in a perfect world. And similarly, the Coast Guard has not always been perfect. If public trust was a bank, well, there have been times when we had to make a withdrawal from that bank. It was just a decade ago we were sitting in front of Congress to explain our faltering acquisition program. But we owned our mistakes. We did some introspective learning and ultimately improved. And today, I will put our acquisition team against any in the world. Because today, they are bringing game-changing assets online, on budget, on schedule, that meet all of our operational requirements. And beyond acquisitions and with full transparency, we have opened our ledger. And we've been doing this for some time. And this year, we attained our fifth consecutive clean financial audit opinion. Yes, a fifth. But that only came after many years of hard work to be entrusted stewards of our taxpayers' precious resources, acquisition, accountability, return on investment, a good investment, trust me. But there is no greater breach of trust than a breach against one of our own. And what I'm talking about here is sexual assault. We embarked on a campaign over four years ago to protect our victims and hold those who breached this sacrosanct standard of trust and respect to hold them accountable. We continue to make strides towards removing sexual assault from our service, but there is still much more work that needs to be done. To the victims of this crime who continue to stand the watch in the Coast Guard, thank you for your service, for your strength. You have my commitment that we will continue to protect your privacy, your dignity, in your opportunity to serve. And significantly, this year's Sexual Assault Prevention and Recovery Strategic Plan will, inclu will include a specific focus on victim recovery. Stay with us. And all of this rolls into our steadfast commitment to imbue a culture of respect towards and among our entire Coast Guard team a team that is enriched by an incredible and ever-growing diverse workforce. And our work is far from over. And I must emphasize that while I require every senior member of our service, every flag officer, senior executive service, gold badge, to emulate this culture of respect, every single one of us, all 88,000 of us share in this quintessential responsibility. Now, when I take a look back, and it's not that long ago, our peers were chock full of tired and aging cutters. Today, it's a term Admiral Papp would use, you'll smell fresh paint, that new cutter smell. You'll see new national security cutters, fast response cutters, and on the way are offshore patrol cutters. 
We're closer than we've ever been to new icebreakers, and we're working to field new waterway commerce cutters that will replace our oldest fleet on the water today, some of which are over 70 years old. And we're investing in remotely piloted aircraft and the human capital that comes with all of that. Yes, we are building out the Coast Guard of tomorrow. And in order to do so, we will need 5% annualized growth in our operations and maintenance account and a floor of $2 billion for acquisitions for us to continue to do so. It's a small ask for the smallest armed service whose full appropriation is less than one line item on the appropriations of any of the four other armed services. A small ask and a great return on investment. And we're on the right track. By swinging for the fences, and with the enduring support of this administration and the 115th Congress, we've hit the sweet spot. But the ball is still in play, so to say. And this is just one inning of an infinite game with many at-bats to come. In fiscal years 2018, we are on the cusp of making a major dent in our infrastructure backlog a list that had swollen to over $1.6 billion worth of necessary projects, a sum that would have taken well over a decade to buy down based on past funding levels. And none of this would have been possible without public trust. Public trust that, as you saw today, originates on the front lines of our service. So today, this will be my fourth and final State of the Coast Guard address. I really say that with a sense of remorse, not relief. You may feel the other way around. <laughs> but even with that being said, uh, I and the team that I serve with, uh, we are running at a full sprint, uh, and we are not going to break stride. Uh, and even though my last name, literally, it translates to future in German. The one thing I cannot do is predict the future. But when I do look back at the more than four decades that I have served this great service, what I see is a continuum, a continuum that provides more than a glimpse into that future. I see a continuum of professional growth, a continuum of complexity in a world that is not exactly breaking out in tranquility, in a world that looks to our United States and many times, the authorities of the United States Coast Guard to be the broker of peace and prosperity. I see a continuum of ever-increasing relevancy and demand placed upon our Coast Guard missions. And I see a continuum of being the standard bearers that every Coast Guard around the world aspires to be, the United States Coast Guard, all built upon a rock-solid foundation of trust. So to our men and women serving around the world, to our active duty, reserve, civil, civil servant, auxiliary, to especially our families, you are the light that has illuminated our service, and I cannot be more humbled to serve you as your commandant. In my 40 years, I have witnessed such incredible progress a brand whose glide slope soars ever higher year after year. A glide slope that will continue to gain altitude. And I can say with absolute conviction, on June 1st, when the 26th Commandant takes the helm of what is and will continue to be the world's best Coast Guard, the United States Coast Guard, that glide slope will soar even higher yet. Trust me. So true to our Coast Guard brand that reflects the state of the Coast Guard, yes, our brand is up, trending way up. And yes, the Coast Guard and the state of the Coast Guard can really be summed up in the second stanza of our service song. I won't sing it, <laughs> but I will say it, that we're always ready for the call. We place our trust in thee. Thank you. Thank the men and women who serve our great nation. 
and Semper Paratus. Thank you.